hopefully you understand me. Um, and we'll have a good chat here. I understand that I'm the most important presentation of the day because I sit between all of us and the liquor <laughs> outside. Yeah, <laughs> he's like, yes. So I will try to be brief. Um, uh, uh, you know, my, my story is a, a new one to WSO2. I just joined the company uh, a few weeks ago. Um, so I'm brand new to the company uh, on an operating role. And this is my second time uh, in a middleware company. Um, many, many, many years ago, I worked at BEA for six years. And, uh, and that almost didn't come to be. And if I hadn't worked at BEA, uh, I'm pretty certain that I would not be here and doing a lot of the work that I get to do now. Um, and, and the story's pretty interesting. So uh, back in mid-90s, I was a senior in university, and I was getting my computer science degree. And I was so eager, I was so excited to go out and make my mark. And uh, I had, uh, you know, like top of my marks in university. I was a total nerd. I was going to become, you know, like a great, some sort of software engineer. And uh, in my senior year, I got a job offer in Boston to this really small training outfit. And there was like 10 employees in the company. And they would do local trainings on technologies. And at the time, they were really big in C++ and object-oriented analysis and design. And they wanted to grow their Java practice. You know, Java was nascent. It was still coming online. And uh, somehow, I found them, or they found me. And it was run by this really short, really nice, but very strict German guy, Martin Schellbauer. You know, he was like at attention for everything, very strict in that German sort of way. And I was so eager to get started that they were like, look, you know, you're kind of young, maybe a little bit too young to be doing this sort of stuff. So we're going to send you on assignment. And I hadn't even graduated yet. And I uh, got sent to some place, uh, you know, like a, a thousand miles away during my spring break, which is a, you know, a week in between classes, so that I could go and observe this guy, this Irish guy, uh, teaching some technology that no one really gave a shit about. And, and they wanted, they, they were going to get contracted to rewrite the courseware to somehow make uninteresting technology interesting again. And this was my first assignment. And I fly out there and I get to this class and it's a five day class taught by this Irish guy, barely speaks English, heavy, heavy accent and utterly worthless and boring technology. And, you know, I'm trying to pay attention. I'm trying to learn this stuff because somehow I've got to write a course on it. And I utterly fall asleep right in the middle of that class. I'm just like, <laughs> just dead. So I'm like, you know, he probably didn't notice. I was in the back of the class. Go home. A couple days later, I get called into the boss's office. I haven't even gotten employed yet. I haven't graduated yet. And sure enough, the customer, the client had complained, horribly complained. And you know, <laughs> I'm about to get fired. I haven't even gotten hired yet. And I'm about to get fired from my job. And I'm sitting there nervous. And, and you know, the German, the German CEO, he's just lecturing me, you know, telling me about how bad this is, how awful this looks. And, and my only saving grace, my only saving grace is I had brought a, a camcorder and I recorded the whole darn thing. And, you know, sure enough, replayed it. They looked at it. And they gave me an utter, utter, you know, skin of my teeth pass. You know, gave me one more chance to join this company, um, you know, after I graduated college and to work on their Java course materials. And, and I got lucky that I did. You know, I, I, I worked my tail off for them. Um, but eventually what happened is I got super into EJBs and Java. Um, and I started uh, preparing a bunch of different uh, research and materials on this uh, l long before we just lost something here. What happened? Oh, wow. Too much hand movements. It's not sticking. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, this was before, you know, WebLogic had become potent, uh, before BEA had acquired them. And I was putting these courses online. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, uh, BEA bought WebLogic, and they went on a tear 
and they decided they wanted to buy a training company. They wanted a training company that had Java expertise and EJB expertise, and there was only two companies on the entire planet that had any sort of material in that regards, and ours was one of them. And sure enough, you know, they fly out and say, we're interested in buying you. I hadn't actually written the course materials yet. And so the boss gave me, the German boss gave me five days to write a five-day course on EJBs. And we did it, you know, 20 hours a day. Um, and it totally pulled off. The BEA guys were utterly impressed. And five days later after that, uh, the company was acquired for $5 million by BEA to become their training unit. And, and I was really thankful to uh, Martin because uh, as a thank you gift to me, he paid off all my school debt. Um, I, I got a job at BEA and BEA doubled my salary from where I was there. So uh, that was my new experience and I then spent six years at BEA, fell in love with the middleware market uh, and, and have had a, a pretty interesting career in technology since then. But I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be here today <laughs> if Martin hadn't you know, just given me a little bit of a pass from my first job there. So, um, so with that background, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about you know, our vision for uh, you know, digital transformation uh, and why I'm here at the company and, and what we're going to be doing in the future. But a little bit of background on us here. The uh, company is 12 years old. We now have just under 500 employees. We will definitely cross over that threshold next year. Um, we have offices in a lot of locations, so we have a global presence. Um, and we did our first conference in 2010. Um, this year, we're doing two conferences and the summit, uh, the forum here in Brazil. Uh, but we'll have close to 600 attendees around the world on that. And, and just two weeks ago, we crossed over 400 enterprise customers uh, with us. Uh, and, and that's very exciting. On, on a business level, we don't, we don't advertise our um, numbers, but we are uh, basically profitable. Uh, we don't depend upon venture capital um, at this point in time. And we're growing as fast as MuleSoft is um, with a, a business model that is pure open source. So we are a lot more permissive uh, than MuleSoft, but still growing at the same rate. Um, with the same sort of customer retention. So, so healthy business, uh, strong and active. Um, our technology touches the lives of almost everyone. Um, if you've ever uh, you know, uh, flown with United, uh, if, you've, if you've ever interacted with uh, T-Systems, if you have ever taken an Uber, um, if you know, you've gotten um, some sort of blood testing uh, technology, if you've purchased a transaction online, if you've ever traded at eBay, uh, chances are you have touched our technology in some way, shape, or form. And, um, and this is you know, very surprising because a lot of times uh, you know, WSO2 is not as well known as a certain other vendors there, uh, but we've been very steady, very diligent about uh, developing our open source technology stack uh, working that into uh, very important projects that we see as being sustainable and having an incredible, incredible long lifespan. Um, and as a result, you know, we're now uh, broadly deployed. And you know, we're so broadly deployed that we now we track how often or how many transactions um, we estimate are, are, are uh, executing as a result of some portion of our technology stack. And we just crossed over 5 trillion transactions per year. Um, and, and this is spanning the, the collection of all the customers that we've got. So that's been growing pretty good, um, and, and we expect to see that adoption continue to grow. Uh, we do this across a, a variety of verticals. Um, uh, the verticals that we've touched the most are uh, financial services. Uh, they're roughly about a quarter of our uh, paying customers. Um, healthcare, uh, government, uh, technology, retail, education, and universities, uh, which are you know very dominant, uh, deployed with our identity uh, capabilities, um, and telco, uh, we, and so much so on the telco that we have a, a, a subsidiary, a joint venture with Axiata uh, Digital Services based out of Asia Pacific uh, that focuses exclusively on the telco segment. And we actually just this year launched our first vertical offerings for the financial services market, an open banking solution that focuses on PSD2 compliance um, and other regulatory concerns uh, as, as it relates to APIs and customer access management for the financial services segment. 
So uh, we do very good in these regards. So a, a little bit about you know uh, just my vision of the future. Um, I think we are at a really challenging and interesting intersection of the market. Um, and here's some stunning stats for you. There are now 286,000 SaaS apps on the planet. I, I can't even comprehend that. Uh, here's another statistic. The average knowledge worker, which is all of us in this room, um, is responsible for managing 86 different um, uh, logins to different SaaS apps. So we as knowledge workers have to touch, on average, 86 systems. I was trying to count it up. I mean, on any given day, I probably touched 10 or 12, uh, but I was going through my last pass uh, system, which, which manages like all my different identities, and I've got like 300 uh, different identities in there that it's managing for me. Uh, and, and I don't know how I developed all those, uh, all those over that time. Um, so a, a tremendous uh, amount of SaaS apps. But, but there's some other interesting statistics. We're, we're looking at potentially billions of devices on the planet, uh, billions of identities, uh, and, and particularly so that uh, the average person is carrying uh, sometimes a couple hundred identities um, in profiles. Um, and so how do those interact with businesses? Uh, we have our own legacy internal APIs, custom app ERP systems, uh, but also with data sources and event streams and log management, we're looking at potentially exabytes of data being generated on a daily basis that we have to process in real time. So all of these things are IT assets, and we're having an explosion of IT assets. We've probably been hearing about that for a while. But the challenging part is how do we intersect that with an equal... Um, amount of uh, change and disruption that's happening with developer consumption models. And with developer consumption models, you know, we've obviously seen this very rapid transition from servers to VMs into containers. And, and there's been certain motivations behind that. But we have barely touched the surface of what's going to happen with APIs, functions, and a service and serverless. And, and that's because we're walking into a world where the economic model of functions as a service completely alters the landscape. So in a functions as a service model, you have the potential to pay per request. And you're paying uh, not just for uh, the, the request itself, but the underlying infrastructure on a pay per request. And when you you, you do that, and it's optimized properly, you can avoid, in some circumstances, paying for the uptime of keeping the servers idle. And when you um, can suddenly have a cost that's aligned to a request, it completely changes the economic model of how you think about architecting your systems. And, and sometimes, in some cases, the economics are so attractive that it's going to cause us to have a hyper componentization of our systems. So while containers and VMs historically have encouraged us to try to componentize, if you will, certain systems, we've been reluctant to do so because there hasn't been a strong economic incentive to do it. It's been usually a developer team or an agility or a continuous um, uh, a mechanism that kind of pushes you that way. But now we'll have an economic incentive because every time we break an app into a smaller bits of pieces um, and you can move it into a function as a service, you might be saving money. And if you can keep saving money, there's this tendency to swing the pendulum too far to the other side where we end up with a hyper-componentization. And when you have a hyper-componentization that way, we could be looking at potentially trillions of endpoints you know, an endpoint here is either an API service that you're consuming, uh, perhaps some minor function that you're invoking. Uh, but every developer who's, you know, spending their time writing code will have as many of these functions as potentially unit tests that you've got. And so the number is incalculable. So how does, um, how do you intersect these worlds? And this is certainly going to be a problem, this multi-cloud world on the bottom and this constantly changing developer consumption model on the top. And there was this interesting statistic. Uh, it's in, I think, uh, it's either Mary Meeker's report or another equivalent document where 75% of IT managers now identify that they are concerned about the skill set gap 
that they have to deal with in IT. And, and that skill set gap, I believe, is the combination of how do you just get the domain knowledge on the bottom with these IT assets while still at the same time giving developers their choice of consumption models. And, and I'm a developer myself. My last company, um, you know, I, I actually wrote 5,000 lines of code into the product. That's a badge of honor for me, you know, um, in that. And, and when I was, a, you know, acting as that developer in that role, you know, it was a 24-7 job to stay on top of these things. So this is the, the basic promise that, or a, a challenge that we're facing. So as us as IT managers, how do you increase agility across these legacy assets and emerging technologies? How do we enable developer choice while still preserving um, the release velocity that we're trying to increase? And then how do you build and deploy with Google-style SLAs, which is what we're all striving for, when you have so many third-party services that you cannot control here? So what do you do with this? And um, you know, our basic approach is that we're looking at the world with APIs and streams. And uh, what, what APIs and streams do, particularly data streams, is they offer a, uh, a very nice and consistent abstraction across all those IT assets, including your identities and your devices, and then offer a very simple, very consistent programming model that you can then unlock whatever um, a consumption approach that your developer teams need on there. And, and to the degree that we can standardize access to all these assets in this way, um, we can preserve those productivity gains that we've been seeking. And so, uh, you know, we think of WSO2 as providing a platform for digital agility. And this platform is a programmability platform and what that programmability platform provides are a way for you to connect all your underlying IT assets, whatever they may be, and then expose them either as APIs or streams um, uh, so that you can then develop what we call adaptive services. And these are services that are continuously changing, continuously adapting to the conditions in the marketplace, and that you can then write those services with uh, very simple languages, you know, Java or JavaScript, and that those services, once they're deployed in that platform, they can either be a feedback loop back into those IT assets underneath, or um, they can be managed with policies on our API manager and other storefront mechanisms that we provide, uh, and make these systems accessible to your partners, your customers, your employees, um, other development teams that you work with. Uh, when you come to our uh, website, we currently position ourselves as having five products. Um, we, we, we show them here. You can run these products independently of each other, but a big part of our investment going into the future is that we are uh, going to continue to allow for this independent deployment of these products, but at the same time consolidate into this platform that provides a very simple and reactive programming model for APIs and streams. And, and this is where we're investing heavily. A couple of things, so uh, about our products. So our API management, you've seen a lot about what it can do, uh, but it's about the full life cycle of design, create, publish, and manage APIs. Um, you can deploy this either as a server or in a cloud native way. Uh, we, and we, for most of our products, have either a public cloud offering or a private cloud offering. Uh, while we're not, you know, largely known, we have over 200 enterprises that deploy our API management solution. Those 200 enterprises now manage 20,000 APIs with our product, and those APIs are consumed or touched by more than 200,000 businesses that are their customers or partners that they work with. So uh, we're pretty proud about this. We were one of the earliest providers with API management solution. Um, it's our fastest growing segment of all of our technologies. Uh, and, and I think we've added roughly, we've doubled our customer base in the past year. Uh, on the integration front, right, it's connect anything. Uh, we want to connect all your enterprise systems and data. Uh, this was our first product line. Uh, we have an enterprise service bus. We have message broker. We have a very rich environment full of connectors. A big part of the work that we're doing is enabling 
these connectors to be available through serverless and other forms of uh, programming models out there. And, and we have a continual innovation practice that focuses on scalability and maturity of this capability. Um, identity and access management, which is uh, usually an unusual thing, it's an unusual thing to see in a middleware stack, but there are very few digital experiences that, can be, that cannot be built that don't have some sort of um, need to programmatize the uh, authentication and authorization access for the people who are touching those digital experiences. Our identity server can be used as a programming layer um, as part of um, that overall platform, or it can also act standalone so that you can do single sign-on, multi-factor authentication, and a wide range of, of capabilities. And uh, believe it or not, our uh, identity manager server, we touched 35 million profiles uh, with the, the servers that are deployed. Um, and this is both our open source usage and the people who are our customers as well. And, and you'll see predominantly here that it's uh, telecommunications, uh, financial services, and a huge university and education impact on this. Uh, smart analytics is about how you take data, stateful data, and move it in real time into a stream, and then be able to react in motion to that data uh, uh, with streaming SQL. And we have a popular open source project called City. Uh, City is a, uh, a, an extensible streaming SQL language uh, that provides a, a very common SQL-like syntax, but for processing data in real time. Uh, and one of the things that we boast about, uh, we, we power Uber, with this product line. Um, and we are able to, in a two-node two node setup with our data analytics server, process 200,000 events per second um, on a couple of threads. So uh, we, we optimize this. This is a, a, a big part of our system. And we've got this ready for uh, immense level of scale. And then lastly, you know, Internet of Things, it's, a, it's an interesting tagline. But this is about how do you do analytics and API management for devices in the fog near the edge, and the nature of how you collect the data, what you process before you relay it up to your central system is slightly different, and our IoT server is, is designed and optimized for that. So uh, a little, couple more details about our company. Um, one, uh, all of our software, even though we talk about our products being uh, separate products, it's all one code base. And so the Everything can be pre-integrated and has guarantees on interoperability. So you can actually take our software and mix and match the API management with uh, the data services and, and actually create custom builds with that if you so need to. Uh, we're open source. Uh, our software is all Apache licensed on that. Uh, it makes us fairly unusual. The more common model with um, a, a lot of vendors today is to have an open core model, which is a very small portion of open source IP, and then a much richer portion, which is closed around that. Uh, our technology is very flexible in its deployment. You can use our public cloud. You can use our partners managed cloud. You can use your own private cloud. You can do it at Amazon, um, any of the mega cloud vendors that are there. And so we are very focused on trying to give you a no lock-in experience so that you can move it to where you need to move it. And if necessary, we also have a managed services. We call it managed cloud, where we will do a custom installation and deployment for you on a private VPC, set it up to your uh, specifications, and then we'll provide the administration, the updates, and the operations as well. Uh, we wouldn't get here if we weren't really committed to open source. Uh, we have 300 contributors to open source projects. We give back to 35 projects. Uh, one of the things that uh, we will be doing uh, fairly shortly is we're going to uh, have a, an initiative in 2018 that focuses on uh, really driving a much broader community imprint. Uh, one of the things that WSO2 historically has done has been kind of focused on inward collaboration with our open source technologies. Um, and we're going to be focused next year on outward collaboration, on, on uh, finding ways to bring everybody else to contribute on these projects with us. And so we expect that number to grow. Uh, but we're pretty proud of, of this contribution imprint. So uh, engage with us. Our, 
our business model is pretty simple, right? We uh, sell subscriptions. And uh, when you're on a subscription with us, they're, they're annualized subscriptions, uh, that our goal is to de-risk your project to whatever degree and to accelerate its ultimate success. The, the subscriptions today include uh, production support, uh, developer query support, also important business clauses like warranties and indemnities. Uh, we're going to be uh, expanding the definition of our subscription to start including everything that we can imagine um, to help you facilitate that project along the way. So uh, uh, alerts to admins on security issues, 24-7 uh, security scanning, We'll give you access to our test grids and test frameworks if you want to deploy it for yourself. Um, we've got a, a new update technology that does distributions of patches, updates, and security uh, fixes um, based upon the support channel that you're registered against. So all of that is part of the value um, that we do in our subscription. Uh, because we are an open source business and because we focus on uh, the enterprise, our only ability to grow really comes down from references and referability from other people um, because it's so easy to just not have a relationship with us. And so as a result, when we do have a relationship, uh, we tend to go uh, all in. Um, all of our support, all of our delivery from consultants, architects, training, um, uh, you name it, is always delivered by our level three engineers. We don't have a level one concept. We don't have a level two concept. Um, it's all done by the same people who are working on the products. And this is part of the experience that we have to get closer to the customer because we depend upon your referenceability uh, for us to get into the next account. Um, we, because we've now worked on so many projects, uh, we have a very strong methodology. Uh, we can come into your account and even before you're on a subscription, we can advise. We can refine your strategy. We can work with you on your architecture. And we can also uh, act as some of the delivery capability as well. And whether we act as that delivery capability or you work with our partners, um, we have great global coverage. Uh, we have hundreds of partners who focus on delivery. Um, we have these relationships that we've nurtured over the years. And so we have a number of ways to work with you to guarantee your success. So with that, uh, I, I hope I've made a positive impact. Um, thank you so much for hosting me here today. Uh, thank you to all the speakers. It sounded wonderful. I like the accent. Um, I heard API a lot. <laughs> a lot of English words mixed in Portuguese there. Uh, but uh, for those of you who made it through the whole day, thank you for sticking around. I think we're going to have some drinks here. Our staff, our, our great Brazilian staff is here as well. And, and I hope to chat with as many of you as I can. Thank you.